Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that introduction and, and welcome everyone. We're so excited to be with you uh, today to really talk through um, documentation in the mental health space. Um, and so we're just going to go through a few slides and then I'll give a brief brief introduction to myself and also my uh, colleague Maria will as well. Maria, if we can move to the next slide. All right, so just to kind of start out uh, again, some just general housekeeping here. Um, before we get started, I, I just want to take a moment to share that this material is intended to uh, be used for educational purposes only. Uh, this material is intended to really assist peer professionals as they strive to improve the quality of documentation. Uh, this information must and must be understood as a tool for improving documentation rather than an exhaustive statement of an employer's legal obligations, which are defined by statute, regulation, and standards. So just to say to please consult your, your state guidance um, and uh, any state oversight agencies for specific requirements. We're going to be talking about documentation today, but we're really going to be talking about it from a fundamental perspective. But again, you will need to consult state guidance for more specifics. Next slide. Uh, so just in terms of, again, some housekeeping, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things that Mary said. So we, uh, we will ask participants to, to mute themselves but we do like our presentations to be pretty interactive. So if you do have a question along the way, please feel free to either chat that question in or um, unmute and raise your hand and uh, we'll get to your question. Um, sometimes we find that if the question is relevant to the particular section that we're on, it might be helpful to stop for a moment and answer then. Um, so please feel free to do that. And hopefully some of the folks on the call will help us uh, make sure that we don't um, over, you know, overlook the questions that are coming in. Um, we will also devote some time at the end for Q&A. So again, you can uh, chat your questions in along the way and we'll make sure at the end to uh, look through and provide uh, answers to the questions that we can. Uh, closed captioning is available for this presentation, so just for folks to know. And again, as Mary mentioned, the webinar and uh, slides and recordings will be shared um, after today's presentation. Next slide. So just to give you a brief uh, introduction to, to myself and uh, my colleague, and I'll let her uh, introduce herself momentarily. So I am Yvette Kelly. Uh, I am with N NYU's McSilver Institute, and my title there is the Director of Children's Services and Healthcare Innovation. Um, I am a licensed mental health counselor in New York State by training and have been for the last 20 plus years. Um, and in that role, one of one of my primary roles was overseeing a children's behavioral health clinic, uh, where in that role, I became very versed in documentation requirements for delivering Medicaid billable services. And so that's kind of the, the background and um, the uh, perspective that I'll bring to today's presentation. And Maria, if you just want to give a quick intro before we move forward. Sure. Thank you, Yvette. Hi, everybody. A pleasure to be here with you guys today. My name is Maria Fuentes. I am a family peer training specialist with PeerTAC. Um, I am a family peer advocate credentialed for the past almost six years, um, and I have been an advocate for over 20 years. Uh, so I've been that I bring that perspective into documentation <laughs> and work along with Yvette uh, to find uh, ways to make sure that documentation is done right and understood uh, correctly. So here we are. Um, I'll pass it back to Yvette. Thank you, Maria. And Maria has been invaluable in this process. So uh, she'll have some great information for you as we move forward in today's presentation. Uh, Maria, next slide. So here is what we hope you will walk away with after today's session. So uh, we really want you to be able to identify and speak to why documentation is important in, in the mental health service delivery space. So really understanding that, um, that you gain really a better understanding of the connection between assessment, treatment plan, and progress notes, um, that you're able to specify what information should be included included in quality Medicaid uh, billable progress notes, um, that you can detail how documentation can reflect peer values. And that's a big part. And Maria is going to talk a lot about that. 
Um, but also, um, if you're if you're on the call too, and you have the um, role of supervising other staff, you're really um, identifying strategies to really support effective documentation practices. And so, really, um, to that end, here's what our agenda is going to look like today. Maria, next slide. So we're gonna spend some time reviewing the fundamentals of quality documentation. And just to say that that really is the starting point for understanding um, what is required in the Medicaid billable space. Um, we're gonna discuss some key aspects to consider when documenting, again, in, in the behavioral health space and the charting essentials, what does that mean? We're gonna spend some time talking about how do we translate that into how peers um, write and, and, and document in the record um, in support of mental health service delivery. And then again, as I mentioned, some strategies to strengthen documentation practices. Um, so that will be our agenda for the day. Um, as we always like to just kind of know who is on the line uh, with us and the call with us today, we are going to ask uh, for you to participate in a quick poll that really just tells us a little bit more about who you are. Um, it's helpful for Maria and I to kind of know who's on the call. So if there's a particular area that we can attend to for, for a group of providers, we will do that. So if you could just, uh, you see that poll come up, if you could just let us know if you're a director, manager, non-peer provider, uh, a peer support specialist or advocate, a peer supervisor or other, that would be great. And thank you. So hopefully there's a little bit of something on the call for everyone today. And I'll, you know, when we walk through some of the fundamental slides, again, this is information that can be utilized from, from again, the director manager to the supervisor to the peer themselves. Um, so I'm looking forward to a robust, a robust conversation about those things. Great. All right. So it looks like the poll has closed. And so most of you are uh, peer uh, providers and that's great. We have some supervisors. Uh, we have a couple non-peer providers and just a few uh, directors or managers. And then there's the other. I'd be interested to, to know what the other is. So if you wanna just pop in the chat, just some examples of uh, what, how, you know, what other is, that would be great. So I appreciate again, your um, taking the time to complete that poll. Excellent. All right, next slide. So so we do have, thank you for that. So we have um, another slide just about, again, I think in, in doing a lot of documentation training, um, we always try to understand from the field, like what are the current challenges that you're experiencing as it relates to documentation? So what are some of the reasons that you're struggling with documentation? Or if you're a supervisor, what do you think are some of the, the um, reasons that your staff are struggling with the documentation? So if you could just take, again, another few seconds to let us know what are some of the challenges that you have experienced as it relates to documentation? In a few seconds. And again, so hopefully during the presentation, um, again, if you have if questions come up, hope we'll be able to answer them for you and just give you a little bit more information around how to be uh, the most efficient um, in this task. And really, uh, I think a, a broader understanding of how all the pieces fit together. We still have a couple of minutes, so we'll give folks that. And thank you guys for chatting in. I, I see a lot of the chats a little bit talking about work-life balance, just understanding those those pieces. And so I think we'll again we'll attend to some of that today in the presentation. Excellent. Okay. So it seems like there's a time. Time is a factor in terms of uh completing. Uh, but also not understanding what the requirements are. So lack of um, training on documentation or lack of clarity around what should be included. Uh, 
crafting goals and objectives, and then linking the, those notes to those goals and objectives. So, all right. Well, hopefully, like I said, there will be some information in this presentation that will be supportive of that. And I, again, I, in a larger picture, I think it will link some of the the pieces together, which will give a broader understanding of documentation and then things that you should be doing as a peer provider in this role that really supports uh, mental health service delivery. All right, and hopefully it'll clarify some, some places where it maybe wasn't so clear before. All right, thank you. All right, and next slide. All right, so the, the first thing that I always like to start out with is really talking about the record. And so we're really just going to spend uh, today's presentation by orienting everyone to some general principles as it relates to documentation in the field of behavioral health. So let me say that none of these principles are new, but it really does set the stage for why we want to talk about documentation as an essential component of care. And so by the time you leave this presentation too, I, I, I want to just kind of highlight that, right? Um, that documentation is an essential component of care, and we'll talk through why that is. Um, as a helping professional, part of the role and responsibilities in providing quality of services includes properly documenting in the record. Um, and because a record should be ready for inspection at any time, it's important that providers develop good documentation habits early. It's so much easier to uh, begin in this role understanding what the requirements are and um, and developing good habits to kind of meet those requirements than to spend years in the field and uh, not necessarily understand or put it all together and then have to go back and correct those habits. So um, so that's, but, but we recognize that that happens in the field, right? That folks are not necessarily um, certain about um, what, what needs to be included in the record and how that all fits together. And so we'll, you know, um, we'll talk about, again, some, some strategies for really supporting that, but again, just providing the context for why it's so important. And again, records should be ready for inspection at, at any time, which means that uh, the documentation must be complete and and time and, and completed timely as well. Um, so next slide. All right. So here are some expectations for documenting services in the field, and I like to lay them out in this way because I think sometimes it's not as clear. Um, and so I just want to say that there are just, and it's assumed, let me go back, it's not clear and it's assumed that folks know this. And I say, I, I'm not sure that all folks know this. And so I like to just start off by saying um, there are several expectations around documentation that are integral in the role as a helping professional, right? Um, and this includes maintaining high quality documentation related to the services the agency, the provider is contracted to and subsequently provides, all right? And so while the agency is responsible for the upkeep of records, of individual records, it is expected that um, the individual and or family have an active role in contributing to the contents, and this should be evident in the record, right? And so that means that we should know what the perspectives are of individuals and families, and that should come through in the record. Uh, the cost related to documenting service provision is generally a cost that is included and factored into the administrative costs of the agency. And again, I use that term generally, sometimes it is not, but um, just kind of uh, overall, that's usually, um, part of the administrative rate, all right? And so knowing what and how to document is the key to being efficient in this task. And so we're, that's what we're gonna talk about today in terms of documentation is the knowing the what um, the, and how to document that will help you be more efficient and get this task done in a way that feels um, a little more person-centered in a way that does not necessarily um, you know, uh, include expending an exorbitant amount of time, but in the way that you're able to kind of have this good, I think, work-life balance, right? And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. 
Uh, for this discussion, again, it's important to understand what is meant by the record. And so here is just a brief description. Of course, I won't read everything on this slide, but just know that the record refers to the records of care, treatment, or services provided to an individual and or family by behavioral health service agencies, right? So a number of professionals will contribute to the record, and this will include peer support providers, especially in mental health settings, right? So you will be a contributor to the record. Um, documentation for the record should be completed on a regular basis and completed timely. We'll talk a little bit about what timely means uh, to avoid delays in care, treatment, or services, and that services are documented when provided, you know, no matter the modality, in person, virtually, at home, in the community, um, that all of that information should be included in the record. So when we talk about the record, this is what we're referencing. Next slide. All right, so why documentation matters. This is one of the, I think, most important slides when it comes to talking about documentation and putting it all together and why we why there's so much conversation around timely documentation, what does it mean? And, and I think um, to really underscore the importance of the documentation and understanding that it's really just not a mundane task um, to do, but is something that is is valued in the therapeutic process. So, um, so one thing that needs to be continually stressed is how important it is to our work um, as helping professionals. We we really need to learn to value documentation as the representation of all the hard work that we're doing. Right, the therapeutic process that it represents, and again, not just something that is just an unrelated test that I'm going to do on the side, but really has no bearing on um, the services or the families that I'm providing services to. Right. So that's like a mindset that we want to shift and change. Um, when we value this process, we understand that documentation really serves a valuable purpose to our work um, by being a vehicle by which providers communicate, um, acting as a repository for where the individuals uh, and family needs services and progress is recorded. It provides uh, the basis for reimbursement. And I think overall, this is what it does. It really substantiates all the hard work that is done by providers, right? When documentation is, is, is documented well, it really tells the story of the family and how providers have um, delivered services to really help improve the quality of life for um, individuals and families. Um, and so within this, I think it's important that all of us as an, as an agency, as a supervisor, as directors, all, as a peer provider themselves, it's, it's important for you to understand and relay and reinforce the importance of getting the documentation right, right? Uh, but in order to do that, in order to become the most proficient in this task, um, just know that providers will will need training and support from um, supervisors and agencies to continuously practice the skills learned. I also want to say that this is not a skill that is learned overnight, right? This is these are skills that will take time, right? So you'll come to you're at today's presentation, you're getting some great information. you'll get the slides, you'll get the recording. The next, the next piece of that will be translating it and putting it into action. And what does that mean? Um, so just thinking about that. So, so I, I think, you know, today is, is great information, but it will take the practice of writing and documenting to become good at the skill, but it's, a, but it's a great starting point because at least you'll get some clarity around um, what, what needs to be included or what should be included. Uh, next slide. Um, and so just to kind of bring home the point of why documentation is so uh, important, you know, when providers fail to document appropriately, they're actually depriving the individuals and their families of the ability to access critical information when needed. Um, and so just to say that you can never know or anticipate when an individual or family will need access to pertinent information from their record. So as I mentioned um, earlier, the record should always be reflective and, and up to date uh, for the care that is being provided. Uh, failing to document appropriately can also have a very real impact on an individual's and, uh, and family served, um, especially, especially when individuals and families request information uh, to obtain further care or seek entitlements for which they are eligible, right? So oftentimes we are holding as behavioral health providers, we're holding on to records for individuals. And there are oftentimes, I know in my experience, and maybe you guys have had 
this experience uh, either personally or just know of uh, maybe some uh, folks that you work with who've had this experience where folks need to go back to the agency where they receive services from to obtain documentation proving that they received some type of care at a particular point in time to be eligible for some entitlement. And if that documentation is not available or not um, accurate, you know, not, it wasn't timely, all of that stuff can have major consequences to the individuals and families served. And so as a provider, and again, I, I mentioned I'm a mental health provider, you never want to be in the position of, um, you know, being one of the reasons why someone that you've worked with um, was not able to access um, eligible benefits in a timely fashion, um, because the, the documentation wasn't up to par. Um, that's just not a space that uh, you want to be in. And so we think about, and this is why when you think about documentation as supporting individuals and families, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road as well. Uh, when providers fail to document, it also leaves the organization vulnerable to accusations around lack of quality uh, uh, service provision. So um, just let me say, let the, the lack of timely documentation is one of the first red flags to poor service provision. Uh, so most of us have heard the saying, if, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Um, and so that also impacts, you know, program and service sustainability, because if, because here's the argument, here's the simple argument to that. If you didn't document, it didn't happen. And thus agencies can't be reimbursed appropriately for the services that they ultimately did deliver right? It's a rather simple argument, if you think about it. Um, and so that's why quality documentation goes along with quality services. And so that's um, important to, to understand. And so again, um, you don't want to be in a position where you are rendering quality service, you're doing good work out there meeting with families and individuals really working hard supporting them. And all of that hard work is not getting um, recognized or the, the agency is, or yourself is not getting reimbursed for it just because you didn't you didn't kind of close the loop on that uh, and document what was actually you know what was actually provided so that's important um, and because it really does speak to sustainability around uh you know peer support services themselves right are they are they sustainable um, long term and so it's important that 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 gets recognized um and I also want to say this because oftentimes when when we talk about documentation, I've gotten like questions or c concerns around like, well, you know, um, some people fail to write documentation because they're not good writers, they're concerned. And so I just always like to leave this with you guys to say that um, even documentation that has like grammatical errors, typos, but describes the work done by the provider at the time it was done is better than no documentation at all. All right, so I'm gonna go back to that. I'm gonna say that again, because I think that's important. So even documentation that has grammatical errors or some typos, but describes the work that was done by the provider at the time it was done is better than no documentation at all, right? Of course, this would be something that you would wanna work toward improving on, um, you know, work with your supervisor, get some additional training just to make sure that your uh, documentation is coming across as professional as possible, but it should not stop you from completing timely documentation. All right. Um, so you don't have to write dissertations here. That's not what is needed. Um, I, I actually think providers write a little too much, could write a little less, but but very targeted um, information. But that really shouldn't stop you from completing timely documentation. So uh, becoming, again, as I said, becoming proficient in documenting is a skill that needs to be taught and practice. Um, and individuals really should be supported in this task during the supervision. Um, and really, uh, we, we will identify some supportive strategies later in today's presentation. Next slide. All right. So, so we're, we're talking about specifically Medicaid billable documentation. And here is some just general behavioral health documentation requirements in Medicaid billable programs, right? Um, and peer support services is, is one of those programs that are that is billable in Medicaid. So as peer support services continue to really expand within mental health, there will be some additional considerations for how peer support documentation is written as, again, the documentation needs to meet the state's Medicaid uh, program rules. 
One of the biggest hurdles in translating the work done by a peer provider um, into statements that really reflect like medical necessity, and we'll talk about what that means, um, and which justifies active treatment, is that uh, and represents the the peer scope of practice and and making sure that things are coded correctly. Those are kind of um, some of the challenges that we've heard about that have come up that we kind of really talk to a little bit. Um, but these are all of the requirements. So they, again, needs to meet the state med uh, state's Medicaid program rules, needs to reflect medical necessity um, and justify treatment and clinical rationale, needs to reflect active treatment. What are you doing currently, right? Working with the individual and our family, uh, be complete, concise, accurate. Again, uh, some of the things that we'll talk about moving on to be, be signed, uh, be maintained and available for review, uh, and be coded correctly for billing purposes, right? So making sure that the services you provide uh, are actually represented on a claim form that you then submit for billing and that's accurate. So that's important. Next slide. Um, and also there is there's more than just the provider that's involved in the documentation process. I know probably the provider feels the burden of the documentation, but there's a whole cast of characters who has some stake in um, documentation. And so again, it's um, it's the individual who is providing the services and thus needs to, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the individual who's receiving the services and thus contributing to the record. It's the provider who's articulating that, documenting that in the record. It's the supervisor who's making sure that uh, that is that information is correct and up to date and reflective of those um, of, of the requirements that we just talked about. You know, your if your organization has quality improvement um, departments or an individual who kind of you know does some review of records, it's that person, and then it's your funders who always want to make sure what that they're paying you for a job well done, um, and then that they're able to capture some information and data from that as well. So. Um, Again, while it may seem like the provider kind of has the burden of completing the documentation, there's a, there's a lot of people involved in the process. Next slide. All right, so here, so here's kind of where the rubber meets the road, and we're going to talk through some fundamentals of quality documentation. And again, it's to, you know, to begin to fully understand how to craft meaningful documentation. It's important for all providers to gain an understanding of the fundamentals of quality documentation. What what is what is it? What does it mean? Um, and so we, you know, I've thrown this term out around medical necessity, and I. I I know that there's often lots of conversations about what exactly is medical necessity? What does it mean as a peer provider? Why am I concerned about medical necessity? Like understanding all that. So, but it, but as a provider, as a behavioral health provider, so no matter where on the continuum you fall, if you're providing services to individuals who are in the behavioral health space, this is a term that you should be aware of. Um, and it's one of the fundamental principles related to documentation. It's, it's this concept of uh, medical necessity, which in short just means that the healthcare services rendered must be necessary to treat qualified conditions that impair an individual's functioning. Um, so this is a standard utilized term in healthcare. They use it on the physical health side too. Um, and so but it's the standard that they use to authorize and pay providers for services delivered. Um, so to sum that up, it just means that there someone has a need, right, a mental health need, um, that if that mental health need is not met, that it, it, it is it, it's currently impairing functioning and has the ability to impair functioning further. Um, and so that needs to be mitigated and remediated. Um, and so that's really kind of what medical necessity means. And then on the other side of that, it just means that someone has assessed that these these um, individuals have an impairment that require or have some challenges that require um, some services and that uh, an agency, a provider is going to kind of uh, assess that and uh, provide the services that are necessary to improve functioning. And that really is the whole concept of medical necessity, right? Um, but the key here is that that has to be identified in documentation in order for 
uh, folks to be able to bill for the services delivered. Um, so to that end, if the documentation does not detail medical necessity, then the service is not authorized and thus not billable, right? So there's that little, that argument. And that's why understanding medical necessity uh, from a provider perspective is, is important. Um, so just remember that when you're documenting, in part, you're documenting to meet the standard. And, and just to clarify, that doesn't necessarily mean you as the peer provider are documenting the medical necessity. There's usually a licensed professional who is documenting the need. Um, and I'm not sure if that differs in your, your state, although I, I don't think so. Um, but all the work that you as the provider is doing is supporting the medical necessity, right? And so that's why, again, it's important for you to kind of understand how all of that threads through, right? So um, a, 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 a licensed practitioner might say that this individual needs uh, some service to really assist them in addressing some concern, and they think uh, peer uh, support services is going to be the right service for that. And then your the peer provider role is to really support um, and substantiate what they've done to really meet that need. All right. So I'm just going to stop for here for a minute. I know this is like really content dense, but just want to make sure that I, folks don't have any questions that they need me to address. I'll keep going, but I know it's a lot of information. So I like to take a quick pause. And if not, I will keep going. All right. All right, we'll keep moving through then. So next, let's talk about, Marie, next slide for me. If Let's talk about the golden thread. So the golden thread is really an, a, the, the second concept of um, really related to the fundamentals of documentation, right? Um, and what the golden thread references is really the need for all of the documentation in the record, right? So the assessment that someone does, the service or treatment plan that's put together based on the that assessment, um, and then the progress notes, that all of that information in the record is interrelated and connected and congruent, right? It really weaves together. So the golden thread really weaves together. It's a concept that weaves together all of the critical information and really provides a comprehensive view of the individual. And so it makes it such the reader, the reader of the record, right, will be able to see the logical connection between each piece of documentation, right, beginning with the assessment, and culminating with really billing reporting, right? So the assessment, the treatment plan, progress notes, the discharge summary, and the billing and reporting for the services that were provided, that all of that stuff is congruent and makes sense, right? Um, so that's that's the concept of the golden thread. And the documentation is how the, the, the um, golden thread really gets authenticated in the record. Um, and so, you know, we often get a lot of questions about what 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 is what is this golden thread? What does that mean? Really, uh, and, and just to lay it out, it is really a cyclical process, right? And so it kind of goes around in a circle. So someone comes in, you know, I'll, I'll try to give it to you in kind of like layman terms so that you get the the concepts. Like, so uh, a a child, you say a child comes in, uh, parents says child is struggling, paying attention in schools, resulting in a number of referrals. They're concerned the child may have ADHD. The teacher has uh, alluded to this, and so they're bringing their child in for a, an assessment. Um, a licensed practitioner meets with the family, collects all of the information, meets with the kids, you know, does all of that great stuff, makes some determination that the child is indeed um, suffering with ADHD. Um, and then from that point says that they're eligible for services and they would like to begin treatment to really support the youth and the family and mitigating the symptoms of the ADHD so that the child can improve in his, you know, uh, social development as well as his academic development. All right. So the treatment plan is going to say, you know, we're going to do these things to really support mom and this child and developing some strategies to help reduce the uh, effects of ADHD. And then 
Okay, so that's the that's going to be the treatment plan. And then for the progress notes, um, as a we'll take it from the peer perspective, maybe a, you're one of the services that have been identified in the treatment plan because you're you're going to work with um, the mother. Let's say you're a family peer advocate. You're going to work with mom and dad and really helping them understand um, the the symptoms of ADHD and how that is impacting their son's functioning and strategies that might be um, helpful. Like, you know, that you might have some experience, maybe perhaps you were someone who had similar experience with your child, but you're going to give them support. You're going to, um, you know, empower them to ask questions of other providers about what might be the best way or what might be the best strategies. And so that's going to show up in your progress notes, right? This is how you're supporting this family to meet that goal. Um, and then just say all goes well, you've worked with the family, they've also had some clinical services, you've put it all together, they're doing well, now they're, it's time for discharge. So your the discharge summary is going to say ch child was referred for um you know uh, was referred for services due to ADHD here were the services that provided that really kind of mitigated met that need now they're all good to go and we're going to um, move them on to community based services and then all of the billing and reporting that you did um, from all of that work is going to show up that this was a child. You, we build for um, ADHD service interventions, uh, and and so um, and we receive payment for that. Now we're reporting on that. So like that's the concept around the golden thread. It's all of that stuff links together. Now we know in the real world, right? Sometimes there are other issues that come into play, and and. I think the golden thread concept rec recognizes that it just has to get identified in documentation when 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 things change, right? Um, so this is really so the golden thread is really like a a, clin a silical process, right? Um, it 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 is just to say that this is not a theoretical approach to how you work with individuals and families, right? It's it's not theoretical approach to how you work with them. This is really how the documentation is completed and aligned to support the care of the individual and family for services. Um, so again, when speaking about the golden thread, there are three general processes of areas of alignment. That's assessment followed by service or treatment planning, which is then followed by progress notes. Like those are the primary, all of those things should be aligned. Next slide, a slide. Um, Yvette. Yes. There are a couple of uh, comments in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. One uh, that came up after you asked that question before about anything anyone wanted to uh, question. I have been told to talk to the clinician before documenting, and then they tell me if they want to chart on that. Yeah, so is this, so is the question, tell me what the question is. It's not a question, it's just oh, a statement. Uh, okay. I'm putting it out there yeah. for you. And there's another one that says, um, what would be good to know is the buzzwords. And I, th I think that's when you first put up Medicaid and documentation for Medicaid. So yeah. just so that you know that those statements were in there. Yeah, I appreciate those statements. So a couple of things, you know, I think when we talk about how, um, you know, how the documentation comes through for peer providers. I think we also have to be cognizant that sometimes organizations have different workflow processes for how the peer supports um, the documentation in the record. And that's going to look different from, from everyone. Um, and I know that sometimes, you know, from my experience, I've heard that sometimes providers, you know, how things get entered into an electronic health record versus like who approves it. Like there's a a, a variety of different workflow pro, um, pra practices that providers have. And so um, the question is probably a, a better question to the organization around like, what's what's the process for how I contribute valuable information to the record of this individual, right? How, how does that work? What what's the mechanism for me being able to do that? Because you guys do have valuable information that needs to be included. You, a lot of times you guys are soliciting the pers perspectives of individuals, families that you're working with that perhaps they had not shared with the clinical staff and that needs to be represented in the record. So I think that is, um, that's, that's the question, right? Um, and how does that get what's the workflow process for your organization around that and probably some conversations uh, to be had about that. 
Uh, and the other comment, I'm sorry, Mary, can you just, I, I did want to say something about the other comment as well. Uh, it, it was asking about knowing the, they want to know oh, the, the buzzwords. buzzwords. Yeah. So I'm giving them to you right here. Medical necessity, top buzzword. Hey, you gotta know that, that like, that's that, you gotta know that. That's why I'm going to the golden thread, top buzzwords. Um, there's some buzzwords that you can use and we'll, uh, I think in Maria's section, we'll give you some samples in terms of what peers are doing and how you are representing that in the record. Um, there's some sample kind of act, you know, action statements that you should be putting in that are some buzzwords. Um, and here, and here's the thing, the buzzwords are only to know the concept around how all of these things fit together. There, I, I don't think the expectation is for a peer provider to write like a clinician. I don't want to give that impression. That's that's not the impression I'm um want to give. What I'm saying is you need to understand how it all fits together and how you're supporting medical necessity and actually be okay to talk about, well, how is this meeting medical necessity? Well, this is meeting medical necessity because blah, blah, blah. Like you need to be able to be responsive to that. But when you're writing your notes around how you're working with with individuals and families and things like you don't need to be writing clinical kind of documentation. We got a couple of samples for you as well to, to help kind of flesh out that concept. Um, so thanks for those questions and thank you, Mary. And as they, as they come in, please, please stop me. I know because it could be really kind of content dense. So I just want to make sure I'm uh, getting to uh, the, the questions that folks have and, and they're understanding the concept. So Yvette, mm -hmm. I, we did get another one and it said, so every note has to say medical necessity? So not every note has to, that term does not have to be in the note. Um, and there's, we're going to move forward a little bit and there's going to be an example of what should be included in a progress note. And that's where I will um, detail kind of what, what needs to be included. But the term itself doesn't need to be included. You don't have to say like, here's the medical necessity. You don't have to do that. I'll show you how to, how to what needs to happen as you move forward and what are the key concepts you need to pull forward in a note. All right. So again, um, for this slide, this is just a representation of, again, how how the the um, golden thread is maintained. And I kind of just walked through that again. Right. So assessment to service planning uh, to then service delivery. Right. So someone comes in, they have a need. There's a plan that's identified, you know, maybe they get a diagnosis, there's a plan that's identified. Then there's the service delivery piece. You know, they have a variety of services, clinical services, peer services, they provide that. Then they write progress notes. And then again, we loop back into to billing and reporting. Um, and so that really, again, is just, a, again, a graphic rep representation of the golden thread. Um, but, you know, I think important here is like, why is this important? And so for, for two main reasons that we're going to boil this down, right? Um, it's really to help the individual um, or family like seeking services, right? So to help them understand that as well. And um, to really, again, help to support the medical necessity uh, for, um, for the services that are being delivered. Next slide. All right. So assessment, maintain the golden thread just quickly here. Um, when an individual seeks out behavioral health services, the first thing, again, the provider must do is simply identify what the needs are. And this is done by meeting with an individual or family to review their concerns and challenges and their needs. Um, again, at, at times, just learning more about the noted concerns and speaking with others is useful. Um, it's always an ongoing process here, changing as you learn more about the individual or family, and it could be inclusive of, you know, contacting other significant people in their life, family, if they're, you know, uh, adults and children, actually, uh, but other caretakers, teachers, any other collaterals who may have useful information um, to provide. Next slide. 
That then translates into the output for the service plan, which just includes a general outline of the services identified, allows for space to measure outcomes as the individual or family progresses through treatment. Are they hitting the mark? Are they not? Do they need a different pl service plan? And it really is fluid to allow for mid-course uh, corrections. And here's that include goals, objectives, and interventions. And again, this is generally something that will likely be done from by a licensed professional, uh, you, but, but peer providers should have input into this as well. And you should know what the goals um, and objectives are for the families you're servicing, because again, your work is going to be substantiating the needs for this family. So that's why it's important to connect all of that, right? You may not, you, you may not author this plan. And I understand that. So you, you may get a plan. You may say, we saw a little Johnny and here's, um, and here's his service plan. And, you know, goal three is what we think you could be helpful on. And so your, as, as a peer provider, your job would be to link back to goal three and all the work that you do is going to be in support of goal th three. And that's just an arbitrary goal, but that's how all of this links together. Next slide. Uh, and then, so the, the progress notes are really just around Recording, again, we talked about this recording, um, the services that have been provided by the professional, demonstrating that the interventions delivered really connect back to the established goals, and then identifying the individual's uh, progress. And so that is um, the, the golden thread. Again, that's how that loops back around. Um, so that's progress notes. Uh, so next slide. All right. So um, just to provide a, a brief example, kind of just, I, I like to do this just to kind of drive home the concepts around um, understanding how this all fits together. And so um, here's an example, I'll read it. So, you know, Arlene has shared feeling that she feels hopeless, empty and anxious most days, you know, she's saying she's she wakes up feeling sad. Um, after seeking services, she was assessed to be struggling with depression and generalized anxiety disorder as diagnosed by a licensed professional. Um, during the assessment, it was also determined that Arlene may benefit from peer support services as the service is critical in supporting individuals in informed decision making around treatment options, right? So someone said we, we want her to have peer support services. And Arlene indicated a desire to work with a certified peer specialist, all right? So that's kind of just that flow, right? Uh, next slide. Um, and so here is uh, an example of a service or treatment plan or a partial example that was developed collaboratively with Arlene and the treatment team. And the following goals and objectives were, were developed. So the goal overall here is really to help Arlene improve her ability to manage her anxiety, her depression, and cope with her related stress. And now there takes a team of people to really support Arlene in managing and meeting that goal, right? It's not just, it's not just the clinician, but in this particular treatment plan, they've also decided that again, that peer support services would be helpful to Arlene. And so if we look down here, um, it, well, let, let's look at the top one. So in the objective section, uh, number letter C, not number, letter C. So over the next three months, Arlene will learn three new strategies of coping with routine stressors to reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression, and will practice these strategies daily. Um, that then will map down to, well, how are we going to get her there? Who's going to help her with that? What's that going to look like? And so for methods and interventions, we say over the next three months, they're here. So here's the peer provider role, right? This is why here's a peer provider. So over the next three months, the certified peer specialist is going to meet with Arlene individually each week for 30 to 60 minutes to really explore what wellness would look like for her and begin to take steps to cope with the feelings of depression and anxiety. They're going to use a strengths-based approach to, dis to discuss dimensions of wellness with Arlene. And so that is the piece of the pie that the peer would have. And so that would be the focus of the work that they're doing again to support to support um, Arlene meeting her goal, right? Which substantiates the medical necessity piece. And I see there's a hand up, so I am going to stop to just see if Erica, if you want to just unmute and ask your question. 
Yeah, so it might just be a matter of uh, language. Like, I know we fill out like a CDA, which that's just a piece I'm a little confused on, a clinic, clinical diagnostic assessment, and like the uh, clinician would do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that falls more in the assessment part of this golden thread, correct? Right. Yeah. So that would be the assessment part because there has to be some assessing of what the needs are, which are, which is usually in the Medicaid world that's done by a licensed okay. professional. And Correct. then this service treatment plan, I know the term that we use is um, recovery plan. Like we have yep. peer specific plans. That's the same thing. Yes, it could be. And again, it really depends on the languaging that your organization use, but yeah, so this would be the recovery plan in your organization. So basically what are, what, what, you know, you've assessed that they had some needs, they got together, determine what the treatment plan is or the recovery plan is. And then the next step would be service delivery, right. To provide services and then to document the services provided in the progress note. Okay, perfect. Just wanted some clarification. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yvette? Yes. We have something in the chat. Um, there's some questions here. Are quotes from the client necessary for every note? Also, what is considered case sensitive? For example, criminal documentation, client on probation, et cetera. Is that necessary for every note? Oh, you're... Also, you're Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a few of them in here. Okay. <laughs> also, adding other people's names, such as friends or family members, or just put an initial instead of a name. Uh, That's okay. It. I'm going to, we're going to get to those questions. That's coming up. So um, okay. keep those and we're going to move on and we're going to get to all of, to all of those questions. I think you're actually in the next few slides. Um, just briefly for this slide. Uh, maintaining the golden thread. There are some common ways in which documentation falls short in maintaining the, the golden thread. And here they are, because um, it does require a constant focus on meeting the needs of the individuals and documenting in a way that both establishes the need for the service, or again, and provides information that supports decisions, interventions, and overall service provision. Um, so if you want to, you know, as if you're a supervisor or as your peer provider yourself and you kind of want to just, you know, check yourself, here are some telltale signs of misalignment in the documentation, right? Um, and, and how the documentation may fall short in maintaining the golden thread. Um, that progress notes don't link back to the goals and objectives in the service plan. So, um, you know, you're working on an area that has not even been assessed or identified as a need for an individual or youth. That's that's a telltale sign. Um, progress notes address a variety of issues, none that have been identified as a need, right? Um, that specific, the specifics of interventions used in sessions are not described clearly or not within the scope of the role. So if you are a peer provider, you shouldn't be writing a progress notes that says that you've diagnosed an individual with, you know, depression. That's not within your scope of practice. So that right there is a telltale sign. Um, that goals and objectives are not individualized or not connected to the assessment findings, right? So not cookie cutter goals and objectives. They really should be specific to the individuals being served. Um, and so that's important. And then service goals, objectives, and interventions are not updated when new issues emerge. Again, this is a very dynamic process. You, As you guys know, you, you work in the field. So as new issues emerge and things change or people meet goal areas, all of that sh stuff should be reflected in the documentation and updated. And so um, that is going to be important. All right, so let's move on to the progress note. So I think this we had a couple questions here, and so I'm going to spend some some time here talking through um, the progress note. So when we're talking about what should be included in the progress note, I always say the progress note is not a dissertation. The you don't have to write lengthy progress notes. Honestly, the standard that we train by, once you have some practice and you're pretty kind of versed with what goes in, goes out, it should only take a provider a good five minutes to write a note, right? Because it's a very targeted note. 
um, the first few things that always get included in notes is just like the demographic information. And if you're working in an electronic health record, you know, most of the time that information is pulled, right? Like client name, address, number, all of that stuff. But we also need to know, you also need to mark off like who, who was present and participated in the sessions. You know, where did the session take place again? Was it in the community? Was it at home? Was it somewhere? Somewhere else, all of these stuff, all of this stuff does just basic demographic information needs to be included. Um, and we and when the meeting occurred, um, and in, this usually includes the duration. So was it a 60 minute meeting? Was it a 50 minute meeting? All of that stuff. That's just kind of like the demographics that needs to be included. I, I say it here because I don't want people to think that I'm omitting it. Um, the other piece that needs to be included in the note here is what services were provided to address the individual's needs, concerns as identified in the treatment plan. So I'm going to walk back to Arlene. So remember that example with Arlene. So she had a goal, which was to really reduce her depression, right? Any work that is done needs to be reflective of how you're linking the work that you're doing to meeting that goal. And that has to come through in your progress note. Right. So what services did you provide? If you're a prayer provider, you might have provided and I'm just going to ramble some things off. Maybe you shared your lived experience with her to help her to help her understand um, how, you know, she can overcome a barrier that she that she perceives. Maybe you supported her in advocating for herself because she didn't feel that the treatment plan was the right treatment plan for her. Maybe, I mean, there could be a ton of other things that you do to support that goal. You just need to document it in the note. Um, and then, and, and that really kind of goes along with the interventions provided. What strategies were utilized? What did you do? You know, you have to say what you did in the note. You know, um, I we we role played, you know, um, in, in the situation where we role played to support, you know, Arlene, you know, talking to her therapist around her concerns, right? We, uh, you know, I accompanied you know, mom to a CSE meeting to, you know, help her support and advocate for the needs of her child. So what is it that you did that was in support of that goal? So you, should, you have to put that in the note. That's, that's what you did. And so it's whatever is described in the activities that as a peer provider, you can do in your state. What is billable? Those billable activities, that should show up somewhere. Uh, and then next is really like the plan of action. So what are your next steps, right? What, what are you planning to do next with it, with with this individual? Oh, well, I'm going to meet with them, you know, next week. And we're going to, you know, continue to problem solve around, you know, the, this an issue. Or, you know, we're going to meet next week and I'm going to, you know, take them to uh, another CS, you know, CSE meeting to advocate for additional needs. So it's really like the plan of action. What are you going to do next? Um, and then I usually include like the next meeting. When will you meet the next? I'll meet them in, you know, I usually say the date I'm going to meet them, you know, August 20th at 10 a.m. for the next session. Um, so really, so, so those are like the critical things that are needed in the progress notes, right? That's a targeted Medicaid billable note. Um, and you also want to maybe share the response. We always say response to the end, and this is in the interventions provided too, but I want to comment here. What was the individual's response to the interventions, right? So you're you're working with them. We want to know, are the interventions currently working? You know, mom, and, and it can sound something like this, you know, mom was very engaged in, this, in the um, session, said that the information provided was very helpful to her, or it could say, you know, mom indicated that she doesn't feel what we're currently doing um, is working. Uh, and so that's, you know, those are the things that you need to include in the note. And again, I l let me say this too, because I did see some, this come in the chat. I, I'm a I'm a clinician by training. So sometimes this is where Maria is so helpful for me, right? I use a lot of clinical language because that's in my scope, but but I'm and I and I'm not a peer. And so I rely on my peer friends to clean my language up here, right? So these things don't necessarily need to be in clinical speak, perhaps, but they just need to tie back to, again, 
um, to substantiate medical necessity. It just needs to tie back in the progress note. Um, and so again, we'll show you some examples of more like peer language versus like clinical language, but I did want to preference that because I did see that chat come in. Um, it's not necessarily about like, oh, you have to say, you know, the diagnosis. No, you just have to be able to support the work that you're doing um, is really attending to the goals and objectives that have been assessed, right? That with it, that are within your scope of practice. Next slide, Maria. All right, so next for some charting essentials. Um, we just wanna, next slide. I just wanna kind of talk through um, some of the basics of uh, quality documentation and, and some charting essentials. So this is a great graphic for you to remind folks of what quality documentation is. So I, I love the graphic and it's really just all of the things that we've talked about, right? So that it's complete, it's accurate, it's accessible, it's factual, legible, people can read it. It's done in a timely manner. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's comprehensive. That includes all of the care uh, that's being provided. So that's gonna be important. And we're gonna kind of walk through some of these. Uh, to, and I think it'll answer some of the questions that I got just a little while ago. Uh, next slide. All right. So here are some basics around the charting essentials. Uh, one of the things you'll hear me repeat about documentation is really it should reflect uh, factual and accurate information and really should be free of speculation and judgment. And I say this and, and I'm going to put like a little period here because I think sometimes people think they are not including judgments and speculations in notes, but most of the time people are. And so I'm going to show you how to remedy that um, and what I mean. And so here what we, we, we mean just really stick with the facts and direct observations, right? That's what you're going to be reporting on. You know, you're going to say, you know, if you, um, you know, if you arrive somewhere and mom says she's not feeling well today, you're going to say, you know, arrive for a scheduled session or however you arrive for the session. However, mom indicated she didn't feel well today, right? I'm not going to make any speculations about whether, you know, she didn't look sick or, you know, I don't think she was sick. I'm just going to say exactly what she said. Mom said she didn't feel good today. We rescheduled for the next day. Um, any firsthand direct knowledge or observable actions and behaviors. If you, you know, arrive you know, if you're meeting with someone and they, um, you know, they're using paraphernalia for whatever the reason is, and you can see that with your own eyes, no one has told you that you just, you, you've seen that you would say, you know, arrived at, uh, today, you know, uh, mom, dad, parent, any, anybody, um, was, you know, smoking marijuana upon my arrival, right? Like things that you see, not things that you draw conclusions or assumptions about. So for example, the difference would be if I walked into someone's house and I saw a paraphernalia, like some paraphernalia on the table, you know, I, I can't make the assumption that the person I'm working with is using that paraphernalia. I might mention it. I might say, when I arrived to the home, I noticed there was paraphernalia on the table. I wouldn't say, you know, I arrived to the home and mom's smoking something or dad's smoking something because there's paraphernalia on the table. So really uh, sticking with the facts, right? The hard, cold facts, not embellishing the facts, not belittling the facts, just sticking to the fact. Uh, be concrete, just describe what's being observed. Um, I always say like, and, and I think I have some examples, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait that, but like just a, a matter of making sure that you are just uh, reporting the facts. You want to avoid any um, diagnostic terms and again, document symptoms or behaviors. Remember as peer providers, you're probably not in the role of um, of assessing and making a diagnosis around what is what is depression. Obviously, if the if the individual says, um, I feel very depressed today, that's a great thing to put in quotes, uh, uh, arrived to the home, mom said she feels very depressed today, quoted, right? She says that. You didn't make that assumption of her. That's her saying it. That's how you're going to represent that. Um, and also capturing, you know, you can use direct quotes to capture, uh, you know, the feelings of individuals, you know, and in, in their interpretations of, of their own behaviors. That's important. So again, proves that you're not, not you making that call, but that's kind of what they said. Um, and then leave out your own strong feelings and reactions. Leave, this is 
the record and that is not a place for you to give your opinions or feelings or have strong reactions, you know, um, about anyone. Um, and so that should, that should not be in the record. Um, and so we should work really hard for that. Next slide. Uh, and so just a, a, a mo just a kind of comment around, um, you know, information being uh, free of assumptions and judgments. It's like when you make an assumption, you're reaching a conclusion or making a statement that is accepted or is true without full information or proof, right? So we, we don't want to do that. And when you insert your own interpretation into an individual or record, that's really an example of a judgment, right? And so you're making judgments and, and make no mistake. There's tons of records out here that have lots of judgments from other providers. It's it's not it's not good documentation, but I recognize it happens. But you if you're making a judgment based on your own perspective or values or priorities or cultural biases, you have to understand that that's probably not the place for it, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that you um, again that that the record what you're documenting is free of your own biases and, and judgments. Um, and if you don't have evidence to support it, it probably doesn't belong in the record. So um, just a note there. And go here. Here's an example um, from uh, kind of making a, a judgments and assumptions. And so I just say I just put this here because sometimes it's easier. It comes to life when you're looking at it. But um, so so here's the example. Miguel had had a temper tantrum because his visit with his father was disappointing. Right. That that makes some assumptions about why he's having a temper tantrum um, and the cause of the tantrum, which, they th you know, it's his visit with his father. You and the bet the statement is probably better written like this. Like when Miguel visits with his father or when his visits with his father is over, he was observed crying, throwing toys, and it was difficult to comfort him and redirect him, all right? So that's factual, observable, makes no judgment. The reader can draw their conclusion about what that means, right? But you, as the documenter, did not draw that conclusion, all right? The other one that I always use as an example because it's one that's pretty prominent that I see is the house was filthy and showed a lack of organization, well, what does that mean, right? Filthy is a judgment. What, what does that mean? Um, and so it doesn't really provide the details as to what the filthy is. Um, and so a better way to write a statement around, if you have concerns around how people are keeping the house or whatever, that you, you could say something like this. There may be many, you know, there were many unwashed dishes in the sink food left on the counter. Additionally, there was clothing sprawled out on the floor. Now that's just observable facts, but makes no judgment around whether it's filthy or not. The reader can make that determination on their own, but the writer is not putting that in. So those are just some examples. Uh, and next slide, I'm gonna move a little quickly and just noting time. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but make sure the record is complete. Uh, it's concise. Um, it, you know, it's if there's supporting documentation, if you've used supporting documentation, for example, if you've said, you know, uh, Susie has been diagnosed as depressed, uh, you did not actually do that, you know, make that diagnosis, but a provider did, you need to put that in the record. So it's clear that it's not, that you're not coming out of your scope of practice, right? So as, you know, as diagnosed in the 924 psychiatric report by Dr. Lisa Smith. That's 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 all you really have to say. So they know that it is that's where you got the information from. And you need signatures and credentials always. Next slide. Uh, so this kind of answers the question that that came up a, a little bit before we went in here. So listen, the record should always include relevant information in appropriate detail, right? Only provide information that is directly re relevant to the delivery of services for the intended client outcomes. Um, it should be, the record should be easily interpreted over time. In behavioral health, we use a lot of acronyms, right? So we need to make sure that if someone were to pick up the record 10 years from now, they would understand what was written. And so writing in acronyms is not a great thing. Should always spell it out whenever possible, other if they're other than if they're kind of universally accepted. There are some that are kind of universally accepted. But remember that the chart, the record has to withstand time. So you want to make sure that if they're reading again 10 years later, they they understand. Um, results from individuals may come from uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, requests for individuals may come from um, individuals who receive care, like I said, years ago. And so again, it just needs to be uh, cognizant of that. Um, you want to identify information in relation to critical incidents such as harm to self and others, um, you know, significant safety concerns, any mandated reporting requirements, you want to include that. You also, it should also um, contain information um, relative, like relative to the individual youth or family receiving services. Uh, you shouldn't use names of other individuals in the record, you, especially if it's, they're not the one getting treatment. You can use initials or similar, any other similar method of preserving uh, people's identities, right? So if there's something happening, just say between someone you're serving and a neighbor, you don't want to say like, you know, uh, you know, John is having trouble with the neighbor, with his neighbor, you know, Mike Kelly, like, it, like that, you don't need to include the name. You could say, you know, John is having trouble with his neighbor. You could use initials MK, you know, or, you know, to that degree, but you never want to include other people's information in the record, especially if it's not relevant. So all the information here really should be relevant, relevant to, to the goal meeting. Not everything that people tell you is goes into the record, right? This is, you have to have some discriminating factor about what is relevant to the goals and objectives for this individual right? And so you just have to be mindful of that. Next slide. Uh, information should always be legible with electronic health records. That's less an issue these days. Uh, I, I talked about abbreviations being avoided, uh, signatures. If you are using paper, and I say this because I'm not sure if folks are, but you want to make sure that you're signing your name and date and credentials and not kind of overshadowing any of the written material on the paper. And you should have proper spelling, grammar, and sentence structure. Again, it doesn't mean you that you have to write a dissertation, but that stuff should be in order. You could do that in short form. It doesn't have to be long drawn out sentences. Actually would not recommend that. Uh, again, recommend a more succinct kind of note to include those categories that we reviewed before. You can write, you could write a well-written note uh, really once you've gotten some good practice at it within five minutes, right? If you are targeted in your approach, understand what you did, you could do that in five minutes. It does not take long to write a good quality note. Next. Uh, and notes should be written uh, timely. If you can write the note the same day the service is was provided, that's the best. Um, the, the note really should be completed as soon as possible, right? Helps you remember the details to be more accurate. It's not good practice to allow extensive periods of time to really transpire between when the contact occurred and when you, when you write the note. Again, because oftentimes if you're seeing people in between that time, you're not really recalling the details accurately. Uh, but again, if you could write a note in two, five minutes, you could do that relatively simple after sessions and then not have to. This also helps with work-life balance because you won't have to spend hours upon hours after all of the work that you've done um, to uh, sit down and write your notes. So just think about that as, again, we're talking about developing good documentation habits. Next. A couple of things to leave you with before I think I, I pass it over to Maria to talk a little bit through um, the, the doc, uh, representing documentation um, from the peer perspective, but you know, how accurate is the record if the required documentation is not completed as closest to the event as possible, right? So, so developing a habit to get that done as soon as possible. How available is the record if the information in the record is not current and up to date, again, being timely about the completion of those records? And how reflective is the record if the required documentation is not completed with the participant's input? Participant's input should be infused, and I said that earlier in the presentation, should be infused um, throughout um, the record, right? Their views, their perspectives, what they think is going well, what they think is not going well, what are they struggling, what do they disagree about, all of that stuff uh, should be evident in the record through documentation. Next slide. And hey, Maria, I'm going to pass it over to you. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Yvette. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about peer support documentation. And again, uh, Betty has a question before I move on. So, well, that and a comment. Um, paraphernalia is a clinical term and it doesn't describe what you see. 
you will need to, is it a bong? Is it a spoon? Is it um a spoon and a syringe? That way you have a better idea of what's going on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Betty. Okay. Uh, all right. So we are going to talk about supporting uh, peer support service delivery and documentation. Now, the idea is that the core principles of documentation um, for peers, and we have to make sure that we are writing notes that are talking about um, the recovery that this person is having, right? We walk along the person as peer providers. Um, so we are talking about hope. We're talking about how we partner with them, what the purpose is when we're doing this, uh, when we are meeting with the person that we're meeting with or helping. Um, we are also building on the strengths and empowering the people that we're working with, right? That's part of what being a peer uh, service provider is. Uh, and also recognizing and highlighting that there are multiple ways to get to recovery, right? Uh, no judgment, as Yvette mentioned before, not, none of that. We are literally walking along with a person, and that's the idea. We have to reflect that when we're writing our notes. We have to make sure that we are emphasizing the things that people are telling us uh, when they're important, when they make sense. Um, we also focus on person-centered language. It's super important to do that. Um, as Yvette mentioned before, like she she writes clinical notes, so they look very different. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But the person-centered language is super important. There's so many resources out there that tell you what does that look like. You can teach yourself how to do that and use it within supervision to, to get more support if you're not sure what does that look like. Um, we're talking about the person that is participating in services, right? Uh, we got to make sure that their hopes, their goals, their preferences are actually uh, written down, not what we think that this person needs, right? We're talking about the person that is being supported. So we have to document that because that's awesome work that we're able to do. Uh, we can identify those things with the person that we are talking um, to helping, and we are able to... Um, write down what is it that they're telling us. Um, so we also have to make sure that the the documentation focuses on uh, peers being partners and we're, we are not clinicians, right? And there's often this, uh, this uh, I, I say is a code switch, some type of it. We, we know how to speak the language, right? We understand it, we've been there. Uh, it's not that we don't we don't get what it means or or but we shouldn't be using it to to describe what how we're working with families or how we're working with people, right? Um, that is part of peer documentation. Uh, relationship focus. How are we relating with the person? Like, what is our relationship? What is the foundation of what we're doing, right? What are the services that are being provided? What is it that we are doing together when we are in that space? When we are in that, in that, um, it's not technically, it's not a session, but it would be a meeting, right? We're meeting up with this family, with this person. What is it that we're talking about? Like, how are we um, building that relationship with one another? You can also document that, right? Like, what what are the stages of what's going on? That's important. Relationship building when we are peers is very important with the family. Otherwise, they will not tell us any information, right? And we will never get to know how is it that we can support them best or how it, what is it that they need um, uh, because that it's not our job to uh, figure out or come up with ideas as to what their needs are, right? We want to hear it from them. We want to empower them to make sure that they can tell us. We want to make sure that they're able to um, 
vocalize that too, right? That's part of it, teaching them how to do that for themselves, advocate for themselves. That's huge. Um, that's part of our role. So we also have to make sure that uh, it's trauma-informed. So we understand trauma and we understand trauma in a different lens, right? Um, but we do get that there are so many, so many ways a person can go through trauma and how it can affect them. So documenting things in a way that is not judgmental and in a way that is, if in any way is um, bothering us, if in any way is actually activating us or triggering us, right? That is a clinical term. Uh, it would actually be something we can talk about during supervision. It's something that we can actually bring up and say, because it's important. It's important for us to be able to document properly and be able to tell the person's story. So we're, what are we demonstrating? A focus on recovery and resiliency. Right. That's what the people that we're helping um, want to get to a place of recovery. And they're very resilient. We know we understand that because we've been there as peers. We we get that part. Um, whatever activities that we are being part of, like how are they actually empowering? How are they bringing that hope, that voice, the choice? How are we talking about their families? How are they talking about their children? You know, are we being culturally um, understanding of what is it that they do or how is it that they react or do or do things, right? And so we are not biased when we're writing those notes as Yvette mentioned before. That is very important. Um, also, we're doing this in the community. So let's document those things as to what is it that we're doing to be able to support those families. How do we connect those things to the goals that uh, the clinician is working with with them? And how are we able to support the, their work so we continue to do the work? So that's the idea of uh, peer documentation, right? Um, supporting uh, that is actually based on shared lived experience and mutuality. We can share our story uh, as needed, but only when it's relevant, right? So we, when we're writing that note, we want to make sure that we're not writing our story saying, this is what I went through, um, but we can add a piece of this was shared because this was relevant, right? In, in a way that it emphasizes what the family or the person is going through, not what we have gone through because the chart is theirs, right? And we want to be able to build those uh, notes and be able to, to show. And as I mentioned before, if people come back for, uh, for them to be able to get entitlements at any point, to be able to show what they were going through and what was happening, that they need those entitlements now, whenever that might be. That's super important. Um, that collaboration with other service providers has to be documented. It, it, it does include the safety planning, the care coordination, whoever it is that you're working with along with um, in, in the clinic setting that you're working in. Um, and, and it varies, right? It's not the same thing. Um, sometimes programs have a different setting. You only work with a clinician. There are other places that you work with a psychiatrist, a clinician, you work with other service providers. So make sure that that collaboration between, between you and that person to support the person you guys are supporting is also documented in a way that makes sense. Um, identify any connection of formal and informal supports, whatever that looks like. If you're supporting the family, make sure you write it down. It's definitely great work that you guys are doing. Don't leave it out. It should demonstrate um, human experience language. I said that. I'll say it a thousand times. Avoid clinical language. It is easy to fall into that because we know, we understand it, we use it. I know we've learned it to be able to use it to get help ourselves. I know that was my case. Um, I had to learn certain terms to be able to support my children, to understand, for the doctors to understand what I was trying to say. So I'm well-versed in clinical terminology. 
but it doesn't mean that I'm going to use it when I'm helping a family, right? When I'm helping a, a family, I'm supporting an adult. I'm actually talking to them like I'm talking to anybody else. That's this, this human language, right? It's, it's regular language. Um, make sure to use their words, their terms, their pronouns. I know that's huge, right? What What is it that I, you, you like to be called? Like, make sure you emphasize that because sometimes it's disrespectful to some people, right? Um, and culturally specific terminology of it, if they ask you to. Um, also the core value language and terms related to service description. What does that look like for you? So for peer support, I know that here in New York, uh, we have a set of core values and uh, ethics that we follow, right? When we're family peers, youth peer advocates or adult peer advocates. And it's, uh, there are similar, but they're a little different. So if you don't know what that looks like for you and your state, you do some research on that. It's super cool to try to find out and see how that fits into the work that you're doing with a family, right? Use strength-based and person-first language. Focus on recovery and resilience. That is huge. We are making sure that we are helping families. We're walking along with them. We're not doing the work for them. Um, your documentation should demonstrate you you're connecting back those goals, as I mentioned before, and the objectives of the service and treatment plan. So why does why is that important? You are collaborating with a, a clinician. You are collaborating with uh, other providers that their job is to assess and work with this person to provide the support that they need from another level, right? We are walking along with the family. We're trying to find out how can we support their work to continue this, this, uh, you know, the good work that we do with the families. Uh, the progress notes should capture those activities which are billable. Again, that's another thing, another research, another homework you can do. Go into uh, what is the code, the billing code that you guys have. Bring it up to supervision. Put it together and find out what does it look like. What are the billable? Um, events, what are the available activities that we can do that would actually tie up those goals to that, that uh, assessment that, that would actually make sense. Um, the notes should also describe in detail the strategies, interventions utilized by the peer that are within the scope of the practice. So make sure that you are talking about that good work that you guys are doing. We sometimes left, leave out those, those details <clears throat> and, and there are so many things out there that we can use for person-centered language to tie down strategies and interventions, right? And be action-oriented, right? That's, that's exactly what we're doing for the work as peers. Now, this is a sample of an action statement. So it's a sample. Uh, you don't have to do it like this. Uh, it's just something that you can refer back to at, if needed. Um, assisted, the person's name to prepare for, right? Advocated with Johnny regarding or talked with uh, Mary to discover the strengths, discuss options for A, B, and C, or encourage Mrs. Fuentes to go to the doctor tomorrow, <laughs> you know, just Add, add on to that, um, and these action statements will be helpful to add to those notes. So if you don't know how to write a note to begin with, that was a hard thing for me at the beginning. That was something that I didn't understand how to. Um, there are sentence starters. There are so many things. There's so many resources that you can tap into to kind of put those things together. And again, it doesn't have to be a big uh, sentence. It doesn't have to be a, a paragraph. It doesn't have to be. It's just as long as you're able to link up things that make sense, that actually tie to the goals, that's why you collaborate with the other uh, providers. So for peer service delivery, ask, right? This, this is something that you can work during supervision. You work the, through this with your supervisor or the person that you're working with. What is the workflow process, right? Do we need to develop that? 
Like, do we need to review it? Does it need to be revised? Does it actually show that peer services are being provided? Does it allow me to document that, right? As somebody asked, do I need to, uh, like if my supervisor tells me that I don't need to document unless they tell me to, let's talk about that, right? Like, are my, am I able to bill, right? As a peer service provider, if I'm not putting notes in there, like let's really talk about that and see what how to come it comes up within your agency because it varies. It depends. There are programs that actually don't need any of it, but they like to document just to make sure that you know for safety purposes. They like to make sure that they have some information on on the person they're working with. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they're billing. Um, so that could be something that is a little different. I come from a program like that prior to this this job. Um, so ask, how does your feedback, how does your information come in? Does the, if, if your supervisor doesn't want you to document it directly into the chart, does your supervisor document it for you? Is that something that you put down? Is that something you guys talk together and collaborate to be able to write it down? What does that look like? right? Those are good conversations to have and use supervision for those things. Um, are there any trainings or supports for peer staff documentation requirements? Again, it's not required everywhere. And if you're not in a Medicaid billable or not, if you're not in the billable world, it looks a little bit different, but it is an awesome skill to have because you, you are able to learn it. You're able to learn how to do this step-by-step and there's something else you can add to your to your resume, right? You're well versed in documentation. That's pretty awesome. Um, how much time do you have to be able to write the documentation every day? Do you have a time weekly? Do they give you um, uh, seventy two hours? I do believe it's uh, two days here. If it, I'm not one hundred percent sure. Within two days, you have to write a note. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, all states different. We say as 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 accurately and as um a after the event as possible too. So yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know I was always told within you have two days to write this note, and it needs to be in. And we were not a billable program, but it was just teaching us the skill of doing that and keeping up with that, right? Which I think is awesome. Um, how is the peer staff supported in learning? how to time manage, right? Not everybody knows how to do that. That's not something that we all were born with, the awesome skill of know how to manage our time effectively. That's, there's no shame in that. We know how to do other things, but can we learn it? We can actually get support to be able to uh, complete our documentation in a timely manner. We can get support to do that, right? Um, what oversight processes will be put in place? Is there anything that as uh, administrators they're able to set up to support the peers to be able to do this work? And how will the supervision process be documented? Like, is your supervisor documenting the supervision? That is, that goes according to your program or your um, agency. So that's something you have to talk to your, um, supervisor about. Now, we talked about person center language. So I want to give you guys this. Uh, let's talk about this for a little bit. So meet Drew. I'm going to read you this note. Okay, see this as a note. I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to ask you in a poll, we're, we're going to ask you, how do you feel about uh, Drew? So Drew is an addict that began abusing drugs and alcohol around 12 years old. Drew was manipulative and a real party animal. The addict hit rock bottom and even cut the wrists. The cutter was out of control and placed in rehab at age 13. Drew's mother was unfit and the addict emancipated themselves at age 14 from her and abused the system. So, what do you guys, what is your feeling? What is it that you, how would you describe, if I read you a note like this, how would you describe Drew? Um, Mary, can you, we put that poll up, please? Thank you. 
So what is your impression of Drew? So it says dysfunctional. Is he bright and intelligent, out of control, trouble? I see mostly troubled, out of control, mostly. Very few people say bright and intelligent, or, and I also see a little bit of people saying dysfunctional, but mostly, I'm gonna end the poll. Oh, not everybody went in yet. If you would like to still put in information, yep. Mostly trouble. I'm gonna end the poll because we have another one coming. So mostly trouble and out of control. That's what we got. Okay, so now let's meet Barry. Barry is a person that has a substance use disorder. Barry is a resource resourceful and talented actor that began their career at 11 months old. Their mother took them to many parties and Barry was exposed to substances at a young age. After a couple of years, Barry couldn't successfully cope with their substance use disorder and needed treatment, which they received. Barry's mother was experiencing barriers to successful parenting. Barry decided to emancipate themselves at age 14 as that decision seemed to be self-advocating for their best choice for recovery. Okay, so here in this note, what impression do you have of Barry from reading this note? Um, you have the same choices, dysfunctional, bright, intelligent, out of control, trouble, capable, Yeah, majority saying bright, intelligent, capable. Okay, thank you for answering. I'm gonna share the poll real quick. Mostly bright, intelligent, uh, capable, maybe a little trouble, tiny little out of control. This is how people see, but you guys see the difference in language, right? When we're able to talk about people from a person-centered place, when we're able to not judge what has happened to them or how um, we perceive them, how we're able to talk about them and we're able to document properly their story, right? It makes sense when you read, if this was you, if this was your story, how would you like it documented? Like Drew or like Barry? Now, I would like to add that Drew and Barry are the same person. It's the same story being told in two different ways. That's huge. It really is. Because we saw him in a different light and, and seeing both, both perspectives. So I thank you so much for sharing and answering my poll questions. I'm going to move on to talk about peer support versus clinical notes. So I think this is this is a really interesting thing um, that we have been, you know, tapping into here and there. Uh, peer support notes, they use the language of ordinary, ordinary human experience. They focus on recovery and resilience, includes the person's strengths. It uses the person's goals for recovery. And it is all about that person, okay? Now, clinical notes, on the other hand, they use clinical diagnostic language, like they talk about symptoms, they talk about medication, it focuses on symptoms management, identifies challenges to be addressed, explores root causes of current challenges, and it provides recommendations for services. Now, one is not more important than the other. They both tell a story, just from a different perspective. So. As peers, our job is to take the clinical note and understand what, what's going on with this person. And now we are able to write our notes. We're able to tell our story about the person as, as this goes, right? But they're both very important. 
We need both uh, for a proper treatment. We need both. Uh, this is an example of peer support progress note. I know it seems like a clinical note. I know it seems lengthy. Uh, but if you see the where it's highlighted in purple, there are certain things that are being actually highlighted in this, right? So this is not a clinical note. If you really read it, uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing uh, due to time, but I'll highlight peer specialists share personal experience to talk about how do I tell them that I shared what happened to me? You're not talking about your experience itself, but you're sharing that you shared a part of what has happened to you, to the person. And this is a reason behind that, right? You link it to how, how what, what did your story look like for this person to understand why you decided or not to take medication? You're not forcing the person to do that. It has nothing to do with that. And I think that's a common uh, mistake as well, that a lot of people think that we have a hand up on people and we can tell them, hey, you should do this, you should do that. That's not our role, definitely not, right? Our codes of ethics, we have our, our rules and regulations ourselves, we're professionals, so we know, we know where we stand there. Um, peer specialists and Arlene explore ways to resolve barriers. Uh, to Arlene using learned coping skills consistently. So what does this support? This support her reduction of anxiety. So that part you will find in the assessment where the clinician plays anxiety. And we saw Yvette's note before uh, where it, it actually, everything that you see here and you guys will get the slides, so no worries. Uh, everything that you see here actually links up to the goals that the clinician wrote. So this is the importance of writing a note properly, right? Uh, we're documenting, we're making sure that we're telling a story, we're making sure that we're talking about the person as they have told us. Um, this is a clinical progress note. So it, very different. The language is different. Um, there is something that has come up a lot, and I don't know if it comes up for you guys, uh, talking about writing in third person, which is sometimes something that we learn how to do. Um, clinicians have to write that way, or write writer uh, met with, or you know the social worker met with, and it's not something that we have to do, so that's something we can actually bring up to supervision as well to find out what does it look like what, how would you guys like us to document this, right? But this is how I'm writing it. I met with this person because you're talking about you. You're talking of, you're talking in, in, in the first person, right? You are the person meeting with this person. It's just a, it's a meeting. Um, I know that gets a little murky sometimes. Uh, so the content of peer support provider progress notes consistently links back to the peer support provider's purpose and role. It connects to the individual's stated goals, such as the person requests. Um, make sure you define the goals, the objectives, what is it that the person needs to achieve um, to be able to be part of those communities. That's the intent, right? Make sure the people get to where they wanna be. Uh, define any desires that they have in changing behaviors or if there's anything specific that they wanna change whatever they feel that they want to do, that they need to or they feel like they need to do now. Uh, capture strategic sharing of live experience. Uh, that's important. We talked about that before. It's not about telling our story. It's about telling their story. It's about even if we share a little bit of it, making sure that we are linking those goals to that. It tells steps in navigating various systems to assist the individual family in accessing supports. How are we doing this? What What is it that we're going to do specifically for you to go to um, the food stamp office and get there? What are the steps that sometimes they can't get there, right? Immediately. You just have to go and do this. That's not how it works. How are we documenting the steps that we're taking to be able for them to get there, to be able to get um, an application for food stamps to get their food for their family to to 
you know, be safe and have something to eat. So making sure those things are documented because it's awesome work. Reflects support in decision-making, problem-solving, advocacy, skill development, and community connections. How are we doing that? How are we reflecting that we're doing these things? When we're advocating for them, we're teaching them how to advocate for themselves, mm -hmm. right? We're supporting them into learning the skills themselves. Let's document that because that's awesome. When someone tells you, I was not able to do this six months ago, and then now I'm able to do it because you taught me how to, that's fascinating. Make sure you document that, right? That, that's beautiful. Um, identify strengths, capabilities, interests, preferences, needs, hopes, and dreams, and priorities. Uh, use quotes whenever possible. As Yvette mentioned before, it's important. Note what they say. Address willingness and motivation to invest in recovery. Uh, chart each person recovery and journey and provide opportunities to reflect on success, accomplishment, and lessons learned. It's all a conversation. Um, the golden thread, I'm going to go really quick because I know we don't have a lot of time. It's a little bit different for peers. Is a goal. Is literally related to goals. So if you take anything from here, goals attached to assessments, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're documenting it with person-centered language. What do we need this? We gotta make sure that all of this documentation is appropriate, is proper, that you're able to bill for that. So you get paid, the agency gets paid, but also the family, you, we're respecting the family story. We're making sure that the family, it, this is the story that the family told us. Um, some errors that we see, there is uh, writing lengthy notes, recording irrelevant details, a play-by-play, -play, making it too long, not connecting goals and services, using judgment. Okay. Um, make sure uh, Yvette went through this, write in complete sentences, no acronyms. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same thing. Everything that Yvette taught you was basics of documentation, peers, relate to those uh, basics as well. The only difference is the person-centered language and we are not the clinicians, so we are supporting the clinicians. Um, straightening documentation practices. Yvette, would you like to take this? Yeah, that's that's me hopping on and I, we, I am being mindful of time. So I'm gonna just quickly go through this. And I think just to, to say this, and I said it at the top of this presentation is, this is a lot of information, right? So Maria and I are like shoveling all information for you to be helpful, but that doesn't mean that you walk away um, be, being, you'll have some information around how to do documentation practices better, but it will take time for you to develop those those skills and habits. And so I always just like to end with just saying like, how how are some ways we can strengthen our documentation practices? Uh, thank you. Um, so the one thing that I always say is like, everyone needs to be aware of what the expectations are for, for documentation. And if you are a peer provider, you've come on board, you're not really clear about what the expectation is, please talk with your supervisor about that. Supervisors, please, you know, inform your staff around what, what is the expectation? Have they been trained? Have you told them what exactly needs to go, for example, in that progress note um, slide where it said, you know, these are the boxes. Have you explained to them what you're looking for, what type of information you're looking for? And then have you determined a consistent schedule to meet with the supervisee? This again, practice, this takes practice, time, oversight. Um, it needs to be reviewed consistently, right? So understanding, you know, the the peer provider, like every other provider working on the case should understand what brought the family or individual in for services, what is the identified challenges or symptoms or diagnoses, what are the current struggles, what are their goals and objectives I need to be working towards, and what are the interventions uh, that are within my scope that are helpful to this particular uh, youth or you know, individual or family. All of that stuff should be clear. It should be reviewed in supervision. Providers should have an understanding of that. Um, you know, when, when, uh, reviewing documentation, again, a supervisor's documentation, first of all, uh, should be reviewed periodically. I think initially as, as new peer providers come on, there should be, this dialogue should happen quite frequently and supervisors should be looking over materials just to make sure that they get a gist of what's required. 
Um, you want to make sure that they're following up on things. You know, are there any patterns emerging over time? So this is why documentation is so helpful, right? It helps in coordination of care as well. Um, and, but also talk with them about like what, what they're doing well. You know, if you're a peer provider, what are you doing well? What are your strengths? Where are the areas of growth that you need to really work on? I, I encourage supervisors and su supervisees to spend some supervision time um, writing the note together because that really helps kind of develop the skill. So if possible, um, setting some time aside to be able to do that. I talked earlier about the discrimination factor. That's big here. Not everything you hear needs to go in the uh, progress note, but you do need to know what it is that, that needs to go in and what can just be extra information for you to have, but not necessarily for for the um, progress note allows, allows you to do a more succinct note. Um, if there's other peers on staff who are very knowledgeable about documentation requirements, you know, reach out to them, see if they're able to help and support you in learning those. Um, you definitely don't want to do, I always don't, you know, you don't want to do all the skills at once. You want to make sure that, you know, start with one skill, build one skill. Once you've mastered that skill, move on on to the next. I think that's important. Um, create an action plan for catching up on notes. Try not to be, again, timely is important. So you want to make sure you have a plan in place. Hold yourself accountable. If you find yourself getting behind, don't wait till your week's behind, a couple of days behind. Put an action plan in place. How are you going to catch up? What's that going to look like? Uh, always tell supervisors to role model. Good documentation by you doing uh, good documentation as well and keeping up with like supervision kind of notes, which will help kind of help the provider um, and the supervisor be on the same um, understanding of what's required and and be able to support those practices. Uh, and next slide. And so overall, things to remember about documentation. Again, we shoveled a lot at you in a, in a short time, um, but it is the, in, the individual and family's record. They have the right to see the record at any time. It's important to state the facts, to be non-judgmental, to have person-centered language, to have their views represented. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are doing what's good for the family and really just demonstrating that through documentation. Progress known is a story of their, their life. Be be respectful of that, right? And so you want to uh, make sure you're, you're detailing their needs, but also detailing your hard work as well, all of the work that you're putting in and pouring into families and individuals, you want that to come through too um, in that. So, so it demonstrates you're providing quality service provision. Um, and there's always a chance that your records could be subpoenaed by court or again, families can request records. Um, and so you want them to be as up-to-date, accurate and um, concise and, and uh, professional as possible. And with that, I'm gonna open up for any questions because I know um, that was a lot. So what questions do, do we have? All right, it looks like Erica, you have a question. Yeah, um, so one thing that I, that you just touched on briefly there for a sec is like having that peer-to-peer -peer support system. And um, I mean, just to speak plainly, I like documentation is a big part of my peer support process. I do peer and youth support here in Idaho. Um, and I've been doing that for about two and a half years. Um, and I just kind of got thrown into the lion's den, so to speak, with no supervisor, anything like that. I see that happen at a lot of agencies, um, actually, both agencies that I started at when I first started. I was the only peer support there. And mm -hmm. supervisors didn't really know. Um, so I've made it a really big part of finding the education, being able to educate myself on documentation, specifically peer documentation, um, and trying to implement like any support that I can give to my agency or other peer support specialists that are just starting off. Um, so they don't have to kind of go through what I went through with, with all of that. And I was just curious if you have any examples or any kind of advice on how to implement that within agencies or, you know, um, work with supervisors to kind of show the importance of that, um, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And we've heard that before, even from our perspective. I, the first thing I would always say is if you're a supervisor of peer support and you're not versed in documentation requirements, get your, train yourself up, get yourself versed in those. Cause you can't really help someone if you don't know this, like the oxygen mask, right? You can put it on yourself before you put it on others. So if you don't know it, you can't teach it. 
Um, and so I think that's important. I think from the peer perspective, again, if you're if you can connect with others who are more familiar and aware of what the requirements are, although I will say sometimes agencies have different um, ways in which they they want the documentation done. Um, but we also in New York here, we we developed a documentation done right series that works through a lot of the fundamental pieces that we've talked through. Um, so, you know, we have some resources on our site um, around just um, what do you need to do for the fundamentals, but it really does require, I think it, it does require a team effort. So it, it, it needs more than just just like a solo practitioner, a solo provider just doing, you know, um, learning it on their own. Um, and so in, in a conversation with your administration around like, we, we need to be clear about the expectations. Are there trainings that we can put in place to really support um, developing uh, more documentation skills? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, we're about out of time. We are. Thank you so much, Yvette and Maria. What a great presentation and packed with so much information. I want everybody to remember that we will have both the recording and the slides on the website. Within an hour, I'll send you all uh, an email with the link to the survey. And if one of my, um, my colleagues can throw that link for the survey into the chat. Um, a reminder, you can check your confirmation um, or reminder email for the full CEU requirements. And that evaluation has to be completed in 48 hours. So at about three o'clock on Thursday. And I wanna thank you all for attending. And once again, Yvette and Maria, what great information. I really think that um, you've really helped us out here very much so. Thank, thank you. you and us. Yeah, I was going to say, thank you for having us. It was great talking with all of you. So um, I hopefully you found the information helpful. You'll get the slides, lots of information. Uh, and, and just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank Have you. a great day, everyone. Oh, Allison had a question. I do, just really quickly. I got a lot of emails. Where can I find the evaluation? I'm sorry, I, I want to make I'm sure. I'm going to send you an email. Oh, awesome. with, okay. And it's in the chat right now. It just got oh, it put is. up okay. in the chat, the link. Okay. So. Sorry, there is a couple emails I got with different links, and I want to make sure I didn't lose it. So. <laughs> no, I'll send one out with the slides, too, so you have awesome. a cheat sheet. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. you all. Have a great day, everyone. I'll bye be bye. in touch with you, Yvette and Maria. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.